We are in Jeremiah chapter 49, and our message uh, series has been God Speaks to the Nations, and I think we're ending it with this uh, chapter tonight. Uh, lots of uh, stuff for us tonight. We're going to be covering about five nations. So let's begin in prayer, and then we'll uh, share what God's put in our hearts. Father God, we thank you again for helping us through this day. It was a beautiful day, Lord. We're it was a cool day, Lord. We sometimes forget we're in spring. We want to spring to summer real quick, Lord, but help us to slow down and enjoy the days, Lord, that you have for us. And in that, Lord, help us to take in your word also, Lord. Every book, every chapter, every verse, Lord, it's your word for us. And tonight, again, we talk about peoples. We talk about nations. So in these nations, Lord, of people, there was dads, there was moms, there was children, Lord. And some, Lord, uh, just turned their backs on you, Lord. And though we know that you desire that none perish, that all would come to salvation, Lord, there are people even among us today that just don't want nothing to hear with, from you, Lord, or hear a word of you, Lord. We pray, Lord, that we would not uh, become tiresome, Lord, of hearing about judgment, Lord, but that we would take it to heart, Lord, and be grateful because when you come and judge the earth, Lord, we're not going to be here. We're going to be with you, Lord. So we pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear what you would say to us, Lord, and help us learn from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to share with you, God speaks to the nation. He prophesies against Ammon, and that's going to, it's kind of like a little outline for us, verses 1 through 6. We're going to talk a little bit about Edom, verses 7 to 22, a little, little, little bit about Damascus, the capital of Syria, been, cities that have been around for a long, long time. Then we're going to talk about Qadar, right, the Arabians, uh, through Ishmael, uh, Abraham's descendants, right, and Hazar also. And then finally, we're going to talk about Elam. And what are we talking about? We're talking about these people who, though they didn't receive the commandments that Moses received from God, these people are held accountable. They're held accountable for how they treated Israel and their sins against God. So we look at nations of today, America, England, right? Uh, and just you could fill it with nations, the ones that come to your mind. They also have not received the commandments from the Lord, yet they're going to be judged on how we treated God and how we treated other people. And uh, as we read through this and we, we understand that God has judged them, there's a big judgment that's coming because when we look at ourselves as a nation, especially let's just talk about America, tunnel vision to America, we are still killing babies. Every day we're killing babies. We are still doing wrongs. A majority of the nation's doing wrong. The majority of politicians, it's a big game. It's a big power struggle. So God is going to judge this world, and one of the nations is going to judge is America as well. And yet we have the the privilege of receiving God's word. And we have the, the uh, understanding that we've taken an action to serve the Lord. And we get through times that are tough. And sometimes we don't. Sometimes we might fail uh, for this reason or that reason. And then sometimes we die through our trials, such as sicknesses and things like that. But we are to learn to be grateful for the things that God has for us. You can still walk, talk. I was in the um, cancer unit this afternoon and uh, praying for one of our beloved friends there that uh, cannot move anymore. Her left arm, you know, is just like not cooperating with her. And, and uh, she's going through falls and things like that. And it's not an easy time for people who don't have their faculties anymore. And we're talking about young people, you know, young, not, not old people like me. We're talking about younger people that sometimes... For whatever reasons, we can't explain these illnesses come, these sicknesses come. So I'm telling you, be grateful for the days that you are enjoying your physical abilities to move about, to think, to talk, to walk, to engage, and, and be doing things. So many things to be grateful for. As I was preparing for this Bible study, I was impressed by the Holy Spirit that God had spoken to every nation and its people via the prophet Jeremiah. God speaks to the nations through his people. God says, before I formed you, speaking about Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. 
This was Jeremiah's calling. This was a personal calling from him. But we know that God knows us when we're still in the womb, before we're formed, before we come out and say, ah, when they spank us, you know, or they spank our parents because we came out so ugly, you know, whatever. But the point is that God knows us. It's life. So when we hear about these abortions and we hear about these things, we cringe because of what our nation is doing. Flat out guilty of being um, charged with the charges that God would charge against us, right? When I was growing up and people were actually concerned that God's word would reach the people of the world, it never failed. It would never fail. Someone always asked, well, how about the pygmies in Central Africa? And how about the aborigines in Australia? Have they heard God's word? Will they be judged the same way we are judged? And after those questions, one could kind of sense a little anger from the questionnaire, the person that was asking the question, right? And in church, uh, it's kind of like they were stating it's not fair. It's not fair to them. Man, I wish I could go back sometimes and I could share with the confidence that I have today of knowing God's word. But this is true. God uh, does and he calls people to repentance all over the world. He uses people. And for those that aren't speakers, we know from the book of Romans that nature speaks as well, right? Um, he used people in the past like Jeremiah. He uses people like you and I today to still share his word. Our God does not change. So he desires that none should perish. He wants all to come to repentance. Let me tell you something. Heaven is big enough. You know how sometimes you guys have leftover for Thanksgiving? And you really could have had one or two or sometimes five more people come to dinner. Right? God's house, like the old song used to say, is a very big house. Lots and lots of food. Lots of this and that. There's room in heaven for every single person uh, that calls upon him. There's room in heaven. Even if, if they come late, there's still room in heaven for them. Again, he desires, his heart is that none perish, but that all would come to repentance, that all would be uh, part of his family. So he doesn't force anyone to come, but he certainly conveys his message of love via people like you and me, that we are out there with the people. People have a choice. The pygmies of Central Africa, the aborigine from Australia, and the nations that surrounded Israel during the time of, Jer of Jeremiah, all of them had choices to follow after the Lord, to seek him out, or they have choices to ignore him, right? So with that, we are ready for the rest of the scripture. God speaks to the nation. Number one, we're going to talk about Ammon, right? Verses one through six. Prophecy against the Ammonites. So prophecy means it was before it ever happened. Sometimes years before it happened, but boy, it happened, right? So verse 1, against the Ammonites. You may recall that the Ammonites were the offspring of Lot's incestuous union with one of his daughters. We find that in Genesis chapter 19, verses 20 through 38. Lot is Abraham's nephew. So you kind of see that Lot knew the things about the Lord he had spoken to his, uh, uh, where he was at uh, with his people later on. And so if the people later on don't follow God, and I always say, Dad, you were a bad example. Dad, you were a bad example. Yes, Dad probably was. But you are still responsible as a person who has heard the things from God. <clears throat> so the Ammonites, one thing that characterized them, that they were always the enemies of the Jews. Always, always an enemy of the Jews. Second part of verse 1, thus says the Lord, has Israel no sons? It's a rhetorical question. Has he no heir? So here's the, the beef, the complaint, the um, accusation against the Ammonites. Hear me, right? Ammonites, they moved into Israel's territory when um, Assyria took the northern kingdom captive back in 722 B.C. So the bottom line is this. The Ammonites took Gad and the other cities as though the Jews would never return. Kind of like uh, you leave your house for about uh, eight months and people hear that you have been bankrupt or perhaps you're doing a sentence somewhere and uh, someone moves into your house and never calls your kids or never looks for an heir to your house. 
but someone has moved into your house. And because the fridge was full, and let's just say it was a ranch house and your fields produced corn, and you had a water well and water enough to supply all the water, drinking water for the valley, uh, they took it as if it was theirs, right? God doesn't like that. God says, listen, you cannot move into an area, a geographical region that I gave and assigned to the 12 tribes of Israel. You just can't do that. For us today, if, if you cannot, if you don't think that because something is available and you take it uh, and it belongs to someone else or it would belong to someone else, you should do everything you can to investigate. It is not just yours, right? Can't be. So we are to be responsible. A little thing that comes out of that. We are to be responsible. So here's a country, right? These guys, uh, the Ammonites, they came in and they took over all this land. It was a fertile valley. Assyria had come before, had just destroyed the lot, the, the, the people. But here a country moves into it. And that's what God is saying. Huh, no, you're not going to do this. I'm going to judge you for that, right? So the bottom line is the Ammonites took Gad and the other cities as though the Jews would never return. <coughs> So, third part of verse 1. Why then does Milcom inherit Gad and his people dwell in its cities? Uh, so, church, we want to ask, well, who is this Milcom person, right? Milcom was uh, literally their king, right? But he was an Ammonite god. He was an Ammonite god. And we find that in 1 Kings 11.5. If you go back to Leviticus, he is the, 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 the god Molech, right? So, yeah. So, again, church. Though Assyria had wiped out the northern kingdom, and therefore the land and the survivors of it were down to a few, this land still belonged as, as it had been assigned to the tribe of Gad. God's question and statement is that this territory belonged to Gad's heirs. And though none survived, check this out, though none survived, uh, then it would belong to Judah. It would belong to the rest of the brothers. It would belong to the rest of the inheritance of God's people, right? Even if it, uh, God's guys are no more, it's not a freebie for everyone else. The closest relative then or an heir would be the rest of Judah, and somehow they would have heirs to go into it. Another country just couldn't come in, right, and inherit it. But to let the Ammonites, who just thought that they could walk in and take over and increase their own borders, this was wrong. The land belonged to the heirs, whether the fathers were dead or whether they weren't, whether the children or relatives uh, knew how to inherit, how to file the paperwork, or maybe they don't know how to file paperwork. One cannot take advantage of them. God is seeing from heaven down. And, and, and so for us today, you might say, well, my neighbor took off and these kids are a bunch of dummies. They, they don't even know how to go to court. They wouldn't know how to fill out form number A, B, C or judicial form number 2119 or something like that. So what? Just because they can't doesn't mean you can go in there and cause by any way uh, legal, uh, a legal way, find a legal way, find a loophole and try and take that land. You can't do that before God. He doesn't like us. That is wrong. It is flat out wrong. If you're ever in charge of or play the role of an executor you have to, of a will, you got to make sure that you've, you're looking at everything and you look at the outside. You can't tunnel vision through a will. You have to be looking at the heirs, and even if, the, you, if they're not here or not there, you have to do diligence before a court of law to receive the authority from the judges that you can go ahead and execute the will. With God, it's even more. With God, he sees your heart. He sees if you're not doing things right. Right. And so this is the thing. He will judge us if we know up here that something isn't right and we go after it. It can't be for us. Let these things go. We're only on the earth a little while. Right. Only a little while. So we always have to do the best that we can before him. So the lesson to uh, here again is that mankind may exercise their power and wit to take wrongly and deprive people of their rightful inheritance. Yeah, but it's only for a while, because God will right the wrong. Verse 2, therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will cause to be heard an alarm of war in Rabbah of the Ammonites, of the Ammonites, 
Rabba was their capital city. That's like for us living in Colorado. Hey, uh, the days are coming when Denver's going to be crying out. They're going to be crying out because war is coming. And if Denver's going to be in trouble, so are all its cities that depend on the mother city for everything else. It shall be, look what God says about it. It shall be a desolate mound. That's Raba, right? A desolate mound. No one around, no buildings around. It's like nuclear went off on it, right? And her villages shall be burned with fire. Then Israel shall take possession of his inheritance, says the Lord. So we learn here that one way that God um, punishes the nations that do wrong is by war. That's just one way. The outcome here, the capital city will be left a desolate mound, right? And the cities it supported or the cities that depended upon her to get the goods out to her uh, would be burned. And finally, at the end, Israel will come back and rightfully take possession. So when we, a nation does something wrong like the Ammonites had, God's going to punish her. Verse 3, Wail, O Heshbon, for Ai is plundered. Cry, you daughters of Rabbah. Gird yourselves with sackcloth. <coughs> Lament and run to and fro by the walls, for Milcom shall go into captivity with his priest and his prince together. Again, Babylon would be used by the Lord as his avenger. Run, 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 because here comes the Lord's arm, the Lord's servant at this time, Babylon, to just demolish you guys. Four, why do you boast in the valleys, your flowing valleys, O backsliding daughter, who trusted in her treasures, saying, who will come against me? Let me make two observations here with you for background. First of all, the land was a great land. It had tremendous and awesome valleys that flowed with everything. I mean, water came through it, fruit, hay, everything that anyone could want for their animals or water supplies. or whatever. It was in these valleys. And the Ammonites con uh, considered this treasures. These are treasures over here, right? And they also considered the mountains in a valley and the mountains. We have the Uncompagre one way. We have the other rocks on the other side. They also considered the mountains as walls, as no one would ever come over these walls to come and attack these people in the valley. So they were like this, sitting back all cash and, and enjoying the fruit of the land and whatnot. And uh, uh, this is the picture that we, we see here. Second observation is God calls them backsliding daughter. Do you notice that? Backsliding daughter. Church, they are charged with backsliding or turning away from God and from his worship. Right? Uh, for they, why? Because they were the posterity of Lot. Lot had introduced to them the God of Israel. <laughs> Abraham, right? It's his uncle. So they knew and they had chose not to pursue or follow that. Now, it's true that they had never been in covenant with God, as Israel was, yet, think about this, all idolaters may be called backsliders, for the worship of the true God was prior to all these false gods. People get stubborn, they don't want to follow a God of Israel, so they create their own God. So he calls them backsliders. When you see that, it's kind of like, wow, these are whatever. But indeed, because of Lot, and then second, because you can only be called a backslider if at one time your people knew or you knew. And some of us are shocked when we hear, well, I didn't know my great-grandfather was a preacher. Or I didn't know my uncle Bill knew was a Sunday school teacher for all this time. Yeah, it was in your family, but perhaps your mom and dad decided to go a different way. You're going to suffer because of that. But you, once you hear, you're responsible to come back to the Lord and stop the sliding you're on a skid. Once the people goes on the other, the other way, there's like shh, sliding downhill. Not a good place to be. Five. Behold, I will bring fear upon you, says the Lord God of hosts. From all those who are around you, you shall be driven out, everyone headlong, and no one will gather those who wander off. So everybody would be scared not to open the doors to you. Once fear comes, I mean, when you're afraid... And look what happened to us a few years ago, right, with the COVID thing, right? Everyone became afraid. Everybody was masked. Everybody was this and that. Don't touch me. You know, they, 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 people didn't want to shake hands at church. They, you know, because fear comes in, it causes us to act in a certain way. So for these guys, God says, I am going to bring fear upon you. When the Lord brings fear, now you're in a panic. And so you're running and you're trying to get help. And he says, no one's going to open the door for you. 
And so it becomes kind of like, I believe it was Jalon with uh, Sisera, when, when he comes into the tent, yeah, come and lay down, yeah, have some milk. And as he goes to sleep, she takes a steak and bam, puts it through his head. So that's the, you can't trust anybody. The Lord is saying, no one is going to open doors to you. You're not going to have any confidence on anyone. Kind of like the mask deal, right? Uh, gosh, you know, you don't know who's going to turn you in, who's going to call the CDC, who's going to do whatever. That's how it was for a while. At the end, during the tribulation period, if you don't have the number, you're going to have uh, people uh, telling on you and, and chasing you and whatnot. Hopefully not you, but those that are trying to come back to the Lord or know already about the mark of the beast. But there's going to be panic and there's going to be fear. You don't know when to go out and bring groceries in. I, I can't imagine how it's going to be during the tribulation period. But when I read about this and when you are exposed to this, you start saying, oh, my gosh. This is a real deal that God sends his fear. And then he says, I'm not going to let nobody who even wanders off away from the cities. You get away. You, you got away. You hear. You climb the first hill. And there it is. The people, all the action is over there. But now there's a, maybe three or four houses. And you want to eat. You want to drink. You want to do something. But you're not going to be able to go there because of fear. And plus, they're not going to open the doors even if you made it. Wow. And then we read the last part, verse 6. But afterward, I will bring back the captives of the people of Ammon, says the Lord. <laughs> what? Once again, however, all this goes down. We see the goodness and mercy of the Lord promising to restore the fortunes of the Ammonites when he restores the fortunes of Israel and Judah when? In the future kingdom, during the millennial period. God's going to bring, he's going to, they're going to come out of the woodwork, and God's going to have mercy on them and restore them uh, during that time. God restores them not because they, like us, deserve it, but because of the glory, uh, because they share in the glories that Israel will experience uh, when King Jesus sits on David's throne, right? It's interesting because we read every once in a while in the Gospels, and Jesus saying, salvation is of the Jews, right? Salvation is of the Jews, John 4, 22. And it is. God has a special plan for these, these guys, man. I mean, he has a special plan for them. We forget sometimes that we have been grafted in, right? We're the ones, we're the, we're the Johnny come lately. This is history from way back. We're in the United States. We're still a brand new nation now compared to these guys, right? But we have been grafted in. Remember your privilege but know your history also and why God has mercy on these guys also. Secondly, we talk about, we come to the judgment of Edom, verses 7 to 22. So who were these guys? The Edomites had descended from Jacob's eldest brother, or the elder brother, he only had one, and his name was Esau, right? Whom God bypassed uh, for the blessing, giving it to Jacob. He gave the blessing to J Jacob, Genesis 25, 19 through 34. So the Edomites also, because of their prejudice and whatnot, they were not friendly to the Jews, but their common enemy. Babylon caused them to join the, to join the Jerusalem summit, if you may, in the days of Zedekiah the king. All these little people that kind of had their own little uh, skirmishes and whatnot. When Babylon was coming, they had a summit. And they all came together. Remember Jeremiah 27, 3, right? They all came together on the king Zedekiah to say, hey, guys, we got to stop with our differences. Knock it off. Let's get together because up from the north, we're hearing about this army that's coming down. We got to do something about it. Uh, divided we fall, united we stand, right, or whatever, or backwards, right? But the point is they were all trying to get together so that they could put a good front and actually stop. Babylon from coming down. So that's when they had come together, right? Uh, but against Edom, so it says verse 7, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Is wisdom no more in Taman? Has counsel perished from the prudent? Has their wisdom vanished? 8. Flee, turn back, dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Dedan. For I will bring calamity of Esau upon him. The time that I will punish him... If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave some gleaning grapes? If these by not, would they not destroy until they have enough? But I have made Esau bare. I have uncovered his secret places, and he shall not be able to hide himself. 
His descendants are plundered, his brethren and his neighbors, and he is no more. So Edom's judgment, church, would be like, the, uh, would be like a harvest, but nothing would be left for the gleaners. You know, um, every once in a while, you can go by uh, John Harrell's fields of uh, Olathe sweet corn, and you'll see people picking here and there, you know, and that's okay. Uh, uh, a farmer should always leave something for the poor. That's always been a, a, a custom of Israel as well, right? You always leave a little something for the poor to come in. Uh, if you remember Ruth and Boaz and, and Ruth gleaming from Boaz's fields and stuff like that, it's always a good thing if you have plenty, not to take it all, right? If you happen to have an orange tree, this happens a lot in California, right? Crazy Californians. And uh, you have a wall and your branches come over the wall and you happen to be coming home and you smell your orange trees and all this stuff and, and oranges. And then you see like seven little kids grabbing oranges and sitting down and eating them. Uh, some of these owners get super mad at those kids. If you jumped over the wall, acres of oranges or a big backyard of oranges, you guys know you can't eat oranges forever, right? I mean, we'd love to, big old fat orange. You open it up and it's really sweet. It's not sour and whatnot. It, 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 it's, it's fantastic, but I, I dare you to eat the fourth one. You know, sit down and try to eat the fourth orange. You're about done. And three is my max, and I always try to do that, especially when they're good oranges. I want to take advantage. I want to remember, oh, I've had oranges before. But after the fourth one, you're done. And if you take three a day, after the fifth day, you're done. That's all well you just have. So when the Lord says that he will not leave anything, that means you're looking over the fence or you're trying to get nothing. And that's a punishment. God says that he would come and take it all and not leave anything for the people there. So it's, it's a pretty big punishment. So Eden's judgment would be like the, a harvest where nothing would be left for the glean, gleaners. God would do a thorough job the first time. He'd go through and take everything. Like the other nations, Edom would have to drink of the cup because of her pride and rebellion against the Lord. Right? And we'll see that in verse 16. But check out this, verse 11. Leave your fatherless children. I will preserve them alive. And let your widows trust in me. For thus says the Lord... Behold, those whose judgment was not to drink the cup have assuredly drunk, right? And are you the one who will altogether go unpunished? Nope, I don't think so. It says, you shall not go unpunished, but you shall surely drink of it. For I have sworn by myself, says the Lord, that Basra shall become a desolation, a reproach, a waste, which means a ruin and a curse. And all its cities shall be perpetual waste. So when the Lord would be done with them, he would strip them of all those natural resources and whatnot. It, it, because Babylon was coming, they were going to take everything. 14, I have heard a message from the Lord, and an ambassador has been sent to the nations. Gather together, come, come against her, and rise up to battle. So God did call Babylon to come down. For indeed, I will make you small among nations, despised among men, as he speaks to this nation. Right? Your fierceness has deceived you, the pride of your heart, O you who dwell in the clefts of the rock, who hold the height of the hill. Though you make your nest as high as an eagle, I will bring you down from there, says the Lord. So Edom would have to drink the cup. They're going to be punished as well. Why? Because of her rebellion and her pride against the Lord. Again, they didn't receive the commandments. But they were very much aware of what was happening with Israel. Right? There are people among us who say, well, I never went to Sunday school. Dude, you heard of Sunday school. Well, I never went to church. Dude, in Montrose alone, over 70 and perhaps half of those are real churches. But the point is, they're still churches. They're around you. You know, you can't walk around like a blind man. You can't walk around like a deaf man. They're around you. Right? 17, Edom also shall be in astonishment, shall be in astonishment. Everyone who goes by it will be astonished and will hiss at all its plagues. As in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighbors, says the Lord, no one shall remain there, nor shall a son of man dwell in it. Um, 
I think most of us are familiar with Denver and, and what a big city it is and how it's sprawling, continue, continues to sprawl northward especially, but eastward as well. And if all of a sudden you went to Denver and it was a ghost town, you would be, you would, what happened? What happened to such a great city? Mile high. I mean, what happened if it was all gone? And then if you knew that it was gone because of its, God judged it, you know, you'd probably be one that would hiss <laughs> going by, man, this was, I, Lord, don't ever let me get there where you wipe out my people, my place, or whatever like this. It, it's hard to believe what can happen, but it was the same thing in Hiroshima when they dropped the, the, uh, the bomb, right? It's the same thing with uh, uh, all these other countries that have been just blown away. That we understand, well, war does that. But if you were one who knew the city, if you were the kid that was there when you were a kid and you moved away and you came back 40 years later, 30 years later to see the whole place still gone, it's a bad thing. This is what the Lord's doing to these nations. He's going to finish them. So church, with their cities in the rocks, such as Petra, if you may, they thought they were impregnable. Again, their, their pride, no one's going to get us. We're so smart, right? But they would be destroyed like the cities of the plain, the Lord is comparing them like Sodom and Gomorrah. Just like the disaster happened here, God could take care of it up here in the rocks, in the, in the aspens, in the tellurides, you know, of thing. You think you're safe there? Not when God's judgment comes. But I know a little place past telluride, you know, I know a little place east of this where there's no roads. I get there by horse, right? Nope. God will judge, and no one escapes from his judgment. They would be destroyed. 19, behold, he shall come up like a lion from the floodplain, or a thicket, the thicket of the Jordan, against the dwelling place of the strong. But I will suddenly make him run away from her. And who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her? For who is like me? Who will arraign me? And who is that shepherd who will withstand me? Therefore, hear the counsel of the Lord that he has taken against Edom and his purposes that he has proposed against the inhabitants of Timon. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out or drag them away. Surely he shall make their dwelling places desolate with them. The earth shakes at the noise of their fall. At the cry, at the cry, its noise is heard at the Red Sea. So it's Nebuchadnezzar again who would come about Edom like a lion pouncing out of the thick uh, um, uh, growth around the Jordan River, and he wouldn't spare a flock. You know, it's hard for us to believe that there are, and they were, lions all through Israel in times of old, you know, and that the Jordan was like a forest all around it. I mean, we have, this, you know, man has done it, it's, their things, and God has judged them for so many things. But once upon a time, for sure, uh, there was lines about it. And when, even in the Old Testament, when you read about this or that, uh, the prophet that God said, go in there, deliver the message, and get out of there, and don't come back the same way. But he didn't, right? Another guy came, hey, uh, I am also a prophet, and the Lord has told me, blah, blah, blah. And what? You know? And so he goes with the guy, and what happens? A lion eats him, right? So, yeah, wildlife over there was incredible back in the day. And so here, when we're talking this language, it brings it back up. So Nebuchadnezzar again would come, uh, and he would just wipe them out. 22, behold, he shall come up and fly like the eagle and spread his wings over Basra. The heart of the mighty men of Edom in that day shall be like the heart of a woman in birth pangs. So Nebuchadnezzar, they're hiding in the cliffs. They, they left the valleys, and they think they're going to hide in the cliffs. But Nebuchadnezzar would come down like an eagle, if you may, and so frighten the Edomites that they would agonize like women ready to have their babies, you know. Um, interesting is the fact that the people of Edom, they were noted for their great wisdom, uh, but they wouldn't be able to devise a plan that would save them from the invasion of the Babylonian army. That's why when we read, is there any wisdom left in Timon? Is there any wisdom? You guys were always the smart ones, you know. But here comes Nebuchadnezzar. You know he's coming. They're afraid, and they can't think. They can't come up with a strategy. The Lord has voided them even of their minds to think together and, and to be wise people, right? He's taking care of that as well. 
and, and the Babylon coming and, the, and, and I don't know if you remember, I remember when Judy was having, our, uh, I believe it was Sarah or maybe even Andrea, we were at the hospital and Judy was always ready. I mean, she read the book, she had me hee hee, ha, ha, ice chips and stuff like that. We were in, in those days of Lama's classes and all that stuff. We, we did that every, every Monday night, whether it was Monday night football or not, we were always doing something, these classes. I hated them. I hated them because my dad says, dude, who does this? You know, in our generation, we gave out cigars or bubble gum or something, but we never attended these things. Call me when the baby's born, right? But for my generation, it was, no, you got to be a participant. You know, this is how we do it. And, and so I was going with Judy those things. But so when Judy went into labor, I'll never forget, the, uh, in the rooms next door, I could hear the women, ah, ah, ah. And, and so you start thinking labor is so hard and so harsh. I still can't relate to it. Thank you, Lord. But Judy was all, mm, mm, go ahead. Now, mm, you know, grab my hand. You know, and I see the little ticker, 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 you know, going, whatever. And, and I'm glad for the woman she was. But, uh, and she is. But there are times when you read this that the guys, the armies, the people are going to cry out like a woman going into labor. In other words, like no one to help, and, and they're scared, and it, it's a tough time. Uh, yeah, we can relate. When the Lord's judging, it, it's a big deal. And so know, church, that the Lord, uh, and observe that in the middle of his wrath, though, something incredible happens, right? He remembers his mercy, and he shows compassions, right, for the widows and the orphans. That was in verse 11. That's why I said, well, notice verse 11, right? Uh, bring the, leave your kids with me. Leave the, the widows with me. I'm going to take care of them. Commend them to me, right? He's going to deal with the people, but he's also going to have mercy. Edom's pride will bring her down. And let me just say this to you. Pride always brings a person down. Always brings a person down. Get all puffed up with who you are and what you Forget it. The Lord can bring you down. We come to number three, Damascus, Syria, verse 23 to 27. 23 says, against Damascus. Well, back in Isaiah 17, we learn that the prophet Isaiah had condemned already Damascus, the capital city of Syria. We will read later on how the prophet Amos accused the Syrians, check it out, of treating the people of Gilead like grain on the threshing floor. Amos 1, verse 3 through 5. In other words, the Syrians came in and stomped and walked all over the people of Gilead. Thus God would judge them for their inhumanity, the way they treated the people. It's one way to kill a person. It's another way to start to chopping off their fingers one at a time, their arms and their elbows and, and things like that. That is flat out torture. That's horrible. Inhumane ways of doing things, right? Verse 23, the second part of verse 23. Hamath and Arphad are shamed, for they have heard bad news. They are faint-hearted. There is trouble on the sea or anxiety on the sea. It cannot be quiet. Damascus has grown feeble. She turns to flee and fear has seized her. Anguish and sorrow have taken her like a woman in labor. There's that phrase again. According to Jeremiah, just hearing the news of the approaching Babylonian army, the people would literally freak out. And they would freak out because... They already have heard what Babylon has done to these other countries. So they would freak out when they knew they were the next target. They would freak out. And when, as when we see a restless sea, you know, choppy, choppy waves all over the place, right? Or the people would look like sick patients. You know, sick patients uh, hurting as a woman before delivery. So when it gets to your heart and your soul and takes it all, you're just, I mean, you're a mess. 25. Why is the city of praise not deserted, the city of my joy? Therefore, her young men shall fall in her streets, and all the men of war shall be cut off in that day, says the Lord of hosts. I will kindle a fire in the wall of Damascus, and it shall consume the palaces of Ben-Hadad. They would abandon their ancient cities, if you may, and try to escape their best young men. The 17-year-old, the 18-year-old, the 19-year-old starting to get into the manhood and their strength. The best young men would be killed in the streets. And their fortresses, their palaces would be burned to the ground is what he's saying here. So this message for them is brief, 
but it carries power. How much does God have to say to convince the people that his wrath is about to fall? Does it take many words? Not really, uh, but it's words powerful. And if it's coming, judgment is coming, it's going to come. We come to the fourth, judgment of Kedar, which is the Arabians and Hazar, verse 28 through 33. Church, these are the two desert peoples, right? Kedar was related to Ishmael. Remember Hagar? Abraham had his wife, and then there was Hagar, the other woman who had the uh, Ishmael first before uh, Isaac ever came, the son of promise, right? So uh, Hazar uh, were ancient cities of northern Canaan, right? Jabin was its king. So verse 28 says, against Kedar and against the kingdoms of Hazar. And this is pretty interesting because you don't think about this. But I'm going to try and bring it out for you so you could grab this a little bit, relate to this a little bit more. So against Kedar and against the kingdom of Hazar, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, shall strike, thus says the Lord, arise, go up to Kedar and devastate the men of the east. So that's like the Lord speaking to Babylon, speaking to them and saying, just go do it. You know, God put it in their hearts to do it, right? So church, these two nomadic tribes, how do they live out in the desert? Well, they live by raising sheep. They live by raising camels, right? When Nebuchadnezzar attacked them, it was about 599, 598 B.C., they lost everything. The camel herder had no more camels. The sheep uh, herders had no more sheep. Uh, and listen to their tents. 29, their tents and their flocks they shall take away. They shall take for themselves their curtains, anything of value they would, all their vessels and their camels, and they shall cry out to them, Fear is on every side. Flee. Get away. Dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of of Hazar, says the Lord. For Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has taken counsel against you and has conceived a plan against you. So here they are. They're hearing it. People are talking. We've got to get out of here. Here comes uh, uh, Babylon. But what, you were desert people. What are they going to want with us? Hey, get out. You know, uh, we've got to get out. So they're afraid. And so it's like this. Arise, go to the wealthy nations that dwell securely, says the Lord, which has neither gates nor bars, dwelling alone. But would the Arabs do that? Would they go and settle in the city? You're a country boy. You're going to come and settle in Denver? You're a country girl. You're going to come and settle in New York City? That's the last thing on people's mind when they're the Arabian culture. So... Let's look at the opposite side of the Arabian culture. They are what you and I would say off-grid. The person off-grid has a problem with pride. They think, I'm going to survive, and I don't need anybody else. I'm going to make it on my own. It's me and my family, me, myself, and I. And their egos then tend to grow so big that there's no room for the Lord. And that's what was happening with these guys, with these two tribes, the, 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 her, the, the people of the desert. The people of the desert think that everybody in cities are crazy. Leave us alone. We don't need you you guys. We don't need your jobs. We don't need your God. We can do this all on our own. That's the other side of the coin. And the Lord says, "Uh -uh. uh-uh, uh-uh. You have heard because, again, of Ishmael. Look at trace it back, you know, of the God of Abraham, right? You have heard how God took him from these lands and brought him And gave him uh, a place where the promised land would be. Right? So you can't be a maverick. We are not called as a people to get off on the grid and be on our own. God did not make us for that. God made us to help one another out. To be encouragers of one another. To assemble and together. And to lift up worship to the Lord. That's our calling as God's people. And to be looking up and anticipating his return for us. He is going to bring us to that city. That new Jerusalem. He is going to take us to heaven. What in the world are we doing out in the back 40 by ourselves with our arms like this or our rifles locked on anything that moves? That is a lie of the devil to be out there like that. To be thinking you're going to be a survivalist. You're going to be gone with the rapture of the church. You're not going to be here in those kind of times. But to have that mentality today, well, I don't want people. I don't like people. Put me out there in the middle of Holbrook, Arizona somewhere. 
you know, further past the crater. That is, that is wrong thoughts because you're thinking of yourself and you're thinking you don't need no one and you're thinking you don't need God. That's, the, the, that, well, that's what was up with these guys, right? So they were, these two Arab nations were guilty of living at ease, first of all, by themselves, isolating themselves from others and manifesting pride and arrogance, you know, and self-confidence. They're 32, their camels shall be for booty, that's treasure for someone else, and the multitude of the cattle for plunder. I will scatter to all winds those in the farthest corners, and I will bring their calamity from all its sides, says the Lord. Hazor shall be a dwelling for jackals, a desolation forever. No one shall reside there, nor son of man dwell in it. So here were a people, again, who thought they didn't need God. They didn't need help from any other people. But when Nebuchadnezzar arrived on the scene, they learned how foolish they had been. Again, church, no man can be an island to himself, lest he, his heart grow prideful and he hardens his uh, ego. His ego hardens his heart against themselves. The judgment of Elam, number 5, verse 34 to 39 the Elamites were a Semitic people who were actually the neighbors of the Babylonians. Their country was located beyond the Tigris River from Babylon, right, across from Babylon. And it eventually became part of the Medo-Persian Empire. God gave Jeremiah this prophecy about 597 B.C. during the reign of Zedekiah. 34, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah, the prophet against Elam, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, the king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, behold, I will break the bow of Elam. Okay, so you think about this, right? Reach back, let the bow go. The bow was their power, right? It was before machine guns, before everything else. So when you're looking at, I will break the bow, he's saying, I will break the power of Elam. The foremost of their might. So there, there's that insight. The insight says to us that the Elamite soldiers were known for their archery, right? God promised to break their bowls. Again, that is to break their power. Against Elam 36, I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and scatter them toward all those winds. So he's going to bring it against them. Then he's going to scatter them towards all those winds. There shall be no nation where the outcast of Elam will not go. Church, here God compared then Babylon's army to a storm that would not only blow in from all directions, but it would scatter the people, kind of like there goes Dorothy and Toto and whatnot. Ah, they're gone. He would not only come in from all directions, but also scatter the people in all directions. Get this. He's going to come in. He does things differently. We're just reading about the other ones. I'm going to come in, and I'm going to gleam, gleam, and I'm going to go through once, and you're not going to find anything. He's going to get you one way or another, but he doesn't always do things the same way, right? Now he's talking to these guys, the Elamites. And by the way, there's uh, plenty of Bible prophecy for these guys, that, uh, or, or mention, the Bible mentions these guys all over the place. But he's going to take them and just scatter them. Babylon comes in, and they're going to have some, hey, man, do you mind, Captain, can I take these 25 people with me this way? Yeah. Hey, I'm going down this, I'm going to take them. Take them. You know, and so they would take the people and move the people out and just destroy everything was, that was their central place, and then he would move them out. And they were coming in from everywhere. They couldn't escape from anywhere. So he would scatter the people in all directions. 37, for I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them. My fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. He ain't stopping till the job is done. I will set my throne in Elam and will destroy from there the king and the prince, says the Lord. This is kind of interesting. I will set my throne in Elam. One thing that the nations of old did, <coughs> used to do in the old days, and that was this. Whenever a nation was defeated, whenever a nation was defeated, the victors would set up their, uh, uh, they would set up a king's throne right by the city gate so that everybody that came now knew this place is under new management. 
This place is, has a new sheriff in town, right? So that's what they would do. They would set up a king's throne in the city gate. And that's what God promised to do to Elam in verse 38. God would let them know what he's letting them know. God is letting these people of pride, these people of this and that, that he's the king, not them. You are never the king of yourself. Even when you want to do things that you think, oh, this is going to be great, then you got to say, if you will, Lord, or the Lord's will be done. We say, and the creek don't rise, right? But really we should do things if God will let us do things because to not to do that is not to, is to kind of tell him that you're your own boss. You're not your own boss, right? Nobody is. Interesting is the fact, think about this, I was thinking about this, is that uh, when Jesus comes back at the millennium, we know that he sets up his kingdom where? Jerusalem. And what are we doing as kings and priests? Is he going to put us in different places to show the world that the king, Jesus, is ruling everywhere? Is he going to put you in Telluride? Is he going to take you and put you in Aspen or Malibu? You know, Hawaii? He's going to show the world. Okay, on the count of three, I'm going to give you a chance to think about this. On the count, uh, on the count of three, name out the city out loud or the place, the region that you would want to be in charge of. The Lord says, hey, Bob, where do you want to go? Where do the Sloans want to be? Right? One, two, three. Oh, you, so, you're sad. Sad. Who said Tijuana? No, just kidding. But... Uh, 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 you need to be thinking about these things. Why not? Try and imagine what God has for you. It'll blow you away. When you go to sleep, you'll fall asleep fitfully thinking, oh my gosh, in the old days, God would set, the new king would set up his king right at the entry gate. The new king that took over a city, a nation, wherever their main boulevard. For us, it would be Washington, D.C. Boom! The new person that took over the United States of America would just move us aside the White House and set up his new place, right? When God comes to the earth, when Jesus comes on earth, he sets up in Jerusalem, but we're called the nation of kings and priests. He's going to spread us out because the world then or the, the, the world then is going to go to the greatest population explosion ever. For 1,000 years, sicknesses are taken away. Nothing. You know, if you die at 300 years, it was a premature death. So think about everything, just the, everything being healed, the soils being healed, the trees, the fruit, everything everywhere. God's going to set us up in different places to rule for him, to teach the people. That's part of our priestly duties. So anyway, I liked it. Thought about Telluride, Aspen, Hawaii. Mm, it's just keep thinking, right? 39. But it shall come to pass in the latter days, I will bring back. The captives of Elam, says the Lord. Church, once again, the Lord ended this description of judgment with a promise of mercy. Why he chose to restore Egypt from our last chapter, Moab, Ammon, and Elam, it's not explained. But they will share in the kingdom because of God's grace. Now, as we close here, especially for this evening, long chapter. And I know that you're thinking, my gosh, aren't you tired of reading judgment after judgment after judgment over and over again? Listen, church, there is a danger for us in that sameness can produce tameness. Okay? Sameness can produce tameness and cause us to lose a heart sensitive to the Lord's message. Keep in mind, again, that these prophecies were written about real people, men, women, children. And Jeremiah's words actually came true. Babylon at the end would be destroyed. But interesting is the fact that God never gave the law of Moses, as I said to you before, to any of the other nations that Jeremiah addressed. But he still held them accountable for their sins and how they committed themselves against him and how they committed themselves against humanity. Humanity. Today, the nations of the world, they really haven't changed much. They really haven't. And so we know, because we know the Lord, that judgment is coming on this earth. In America, trafficking, uh, child abuse, uh, abortions, 
I mean, they're one after another after another that are no different than the nations of the past. There is a brutality going on across our country right now that to think God is, is closing his eyes to America, you know, he's not. So he says he's going to judge the earth. The neat thing is, is that he removes us from the judgment so that we don't go through it, right? But think about the people who right now have an opportunity to hear as long as we are here. Be praying that the Lord will give you people that you can share and bring them to the Lord. It's never too late. It's never too late until we're gone. Father God, we thank you for your word once again, Lord. We pray that we would be good listeners, Lord, but more than listeners, that we would uh, ponder, think, and move into action, Lord. Help us not to give up an opportunity when you've made it clear that you're giving us an opportunity to be speaking with others, Lord. Help us, Lord. As we read this last Sunday in the Church of Philadelphia, Lord, we have little strength, but we persevere. Help us to persevere to the end. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.